personality psychologists gathered together adjectives within the English language first that were used to describe human beings as many adjectives as they could collect and then subjected them to a process called factor analysis and what factor analysis does is enable you statistically to determine in some sense how similar adjectives are to one another so for example if you gave a thousand people a list of adjectives to describe themselves with and one of the adjectives was happy and another of the ad adjectives was social you'd find that those who rated themselves high on happy would also rate themselves high on social and those who rated themselves low on happy would also rate themselves low on social and by looking at those patterns of covariation you can determine what the essential dimensions are of human personality one of the dimensions is roughly happiness that's extroversion another dimension is neuroticism it's a negative emotion dimension so if you ask someone if they're anxious and they score high say on a scale of one to seven they're also likely to score high on another item that says that they're sad and it turns out that negative emotions clump together and so that people who experience more of one negative emotion have a propensity to experience more of all of them the more accurate a measure you take of someone's political beliefs the more you find that personality is what's predicting them and I, I think that's a reasonable thing to think about because you know you have to you have to figure out ways of simplifying the world right because you just can't do everything and so people are specialized they have specialized niches that they occupy you can think about them as social niches like a niche is a place where your particular skills would serve to maintain you and so if you're extroverted you're going to look for a social niche because you like to be around people and if you're introverted you're going to spend much more time on your own and so if you're an introverted person for example you're going to want a job where you're not selling and where you're not surrounded by groups of people who are making social demands on you all the time because it'll wear you out whereas if you're extroverted that's just exactly what you want and so the extrovert sees the world as a place of social opportunity and the introvert sees the world as a place to retreat from and spend time alone and it turns out that both of those modes of being are valid the, the issue at least to some degree is whether or not you're fortunate enough to match your temperament with the demands of the environment and I suppose also whether you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough so that you're born in an era where there actually is a niche for your particular temperament because it isn't necessarily the case that that will be the case imagine that all of these temperamental dimensions vary because of evolutionary pressure right so there's a distribution of extroversion a normal distribution most people are somewhere in the middle and then as you go out towards the extremes there are fewer and fewer people and what that means is that on average across large spans of time there have been environments that match every single position on that distribution with most, most of the environments matching the center because otherwise we wouldn't have evolved that way and so sometimes being really extroverted is going to work well for you in a minority of environments, a minority of niches and sometimes it's just going to be a catastrophe I suspect for example that if you live in a tyrannical society where any sign of, 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 of personally oriented activity is likely to get you in trouble that being extroverted and low in neuroticism wouldn't be a very good idea because you're going to be mouthy and happy and saying a lot of things unable to keep your thoughts to yourself and you're going to be relatively fearless now I don't know that for sure because we haven't done the studies that precisely match temperamental proclivity to environmental demand but you get what I mean if you're an extrovert I was going to tell you the extroverted question does being around groups of people make you energetic or does it exhaust you and if, if you're the sort of person that you know will go to a party and interact with 20 people and then you have to go home and be by yourself for like two weeks then you're introverted introverts are exhausted by social interactions extroverts are the opposite They'll, they're 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 energized by social interactions and you know you might be in the middle so that you can take it or leave it with regards to social interactions but you're happy to go to them and you're happy to spend time by yourself but a real extrovert there'll be some of you in here how many of you can't stand spending time alone 
Okay, so there's only two that will admit it. Extroverts are more likely to admit that sort of thing too, by the way. But and how many of you, you like to spend time alone or would rather be alone? Okay, so there's a preponderance of introverts in this class as by, by, by all appearances. But that's a really, that's a pretty canonical question for, for extroversion versus introversion. It's a very stable trait, by the way. It's, it manifests itself early in life and it's, it's stable across the age span. Not completely. Introverts can learn to be extroverted. Extroverts can learn to spend time on their own. I think that actually your capacity to expand your ability past the initial constraints of your biological temperament is something like the development of character or wisdom. You know, so if you're an introvert by nature and you learn how to be extroverted, then that expands your domain of competence. And if you're extroverted and you learn to be introverted, the same thing. But it's almost like, imagine a distribution of extrover introversion here, extroversion here, a normal distribution. You're set uh, when you're young at somewhere along that distribution with some range around it. And I think what you do as you mature, if you develop your skills, is you expand that range, but you're set, the place at which you're set doesn't move that much. So, okay, so there's, so you can think about them as sub-personalities, you can think about them as frames of reference, so frame of reference would be something like, well, since you're extroverted, you value being with people. And so you're going to look at the world, for example, if you're extroverted, you come into a room like this, you think, oh, look, uh, it's a whole field of opportunity for social interactions. And if you're introverted, you think, well, maybe I'll go sit up in the corner and hope everybody leaves me the hell alone. But so, so it's an a priori set of perceptual structures that you bring to bear on a whole sequence of... In, of, of uh, they also tend to set your goals. So extroverted people have, as one goal, the opportunity to engage with other people. So extroverts love parties. They live for parties. They love to tell jokes as well. It's a, that's a very good behavioral marker of extroversion. Um, and so, they, they, because they value those sorts of things, they set them as goals in their life. Or you could say the extroversion operating within them sets them as goals within their life, depending on how deterministic you want to be about it. So, um, I had extroversion, you know, you, you've, you've got a proclivity towards sales, for example. And you're going like, to like occupations where you have a lot of opportunity for social interactions and social networking. You're not going to be happy if your job requires you to sit alone by, you know, for, for extended periods of time and work in the absence of social interaction. You're going to be one of those annoying people then in one of those offices that instead of sitting alone in their office is going from doorway to doorway, engaging everyone in conversation, right? So, and you want to be in a position that capitalizes on your traits because it's really difficult to work contrary to your traits. The If you're really extroverted, and you have a really introverted partner, you're going to engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should, should be, uh, should, should what, subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus, because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them, and, and they just wither on the vine, because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so,